Hi everyone, it's uh, Shane Turner here. I'm a technical director at uh, Abley. Um, and today I'm interviewing Ida Fun Sok Vak from Washington uh, State, who is a sa safety and asset engineer at, at the state. And uh, we're gonna talk about um, road safety culture and um, some of the work that she's doing in innovative work she's doing in safe systems. Hi Ida. Hi. I know that you're from South Africa and you've worked in road safety in South Africa. Um, really interested to know about the culture and safety culture differences between when you were working in South Africa and the US and, uh, and in particular any uh, challenges that you have in the US. Okay. So I have to say two very different worlds. Um, lot more people walking um, in South Africa than in the US um, and walking all over, even on the freeways. Um, and of course, you know, very big differences in terms of uh, wealth and um, resources. Um, but we worked on projects all over the country. So everything from highly developed to even squatter camps where we did asset, asset management and access management. Um, what I found when I moved to the United States was that it was very interesting to see that the different ways in which the government functions also influences what can happen on the ground in terms of safety and things like access management. So in South Africa, it's a centralized government. There are provinces, but the, federal, the central government can say, this is the way it's gonna be. It's almost like when we went to metric. The government just said, as of a certain date, you cannot import anything that isn't metric. And everybody moved to metric, right? In the United States though, it took a whole different spin because what the United States is, is we, we've got a federal government that based on the constitution has certain responsibilities, but then you have the states that functions like countries by themselves. And these countries have um, not only state and local government, you've got counties and cities, but you've got these metropolitan planning organizations on top of that. So it becomes a really complicated mix of federal law, state law, county law, city law. Wow. Um, everybody having their own design manuals and policies and processes and forms and documentation. So it's a big it's a big vehicle or a big ship and the ship turns slowly. Now, on top of that, I would have to say, no matter what country you're in, civil engineers are pretty similar in both countries. Um, tend to not jump on things that are brand new, um, kind of look and check it out before they, they, they decide to give it a try, be very careful and calculated when they do try new things. Um, and like a professor from college told me, it takes about 10 years for a new idea to, to, to happen. Now put that on top of the US system that is so complicated with all the laws and different agencies and funding structures, um, then the reality is it's not that easy to implement. Um, the wonderful thing though, is that we can, when we come together as a safety community from all across the world, and we start leveraging not just what we know in the US, but what we know about Europe and the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and even in the African countries. Um, you know, South Africa has been very innovative in safety and um, in terms of implementation. Uh, by the time that I left in 2001, they were very advanced in the area of things like access management, traffic calming, and all of that. Um, the sorts of which I, I haven't seen here in the US, and I've, I've been to 48 states already. Um, so I was really blown away when I got to the states and everything wasn't always bigger and better. Um, and maybe people will slaughter me for what I just said, but I am an American. Um, that grew up in South Africa. I love this country, but um, I think we need to acknowledge that there are things that we can definitely work on. 
uh, but that our partners from across the world can really help us um, strengthen our approaches that are data-driven and science-based. Yeah, like I also enjoy getting together with um, uh, road safety experts internationally and uh, you and I have known each other I think almost 20 years the first time we met at TRB in Washington I think around 19 years ago and uh, I just so enjoy those connections with the US industry as I do with obviously uh, the Australian Australasian industry as well uh, and you learn so much about what others are doing uh, sometimes we get frustrated that some of the things others are doing you can't implement but uh, it's, it's really uh, enjoyable and most people in road safety are very passionate about what they're doing and trying to achieve. So I think that's what brings us all together. So I, I know Ida that you've been sort of working in uh, Washington State there on some innovative safe system tools. Do you want to talk through some of the work that you've been doing in the safe system area of recent? Yes. So um, I'm doing what we've done but I've done back in South Africa when I was working on our uh, South African road safety manual, and that is leveraging tools and resources from across the world. And so um, had a very close look at what um, the folks um, in New Zealand were doing, Australia, um, in the UK, um, um, Sweden, and let's not forget the Netherlands um, in terms of um, the um, sustainable safety as well. All of that together with things like Vision Zero and Toward Zero and all of that. When you combine all of that, there's some very powerful concepts that one can apply. So the charge I got from my leadership was to develop um, a tool that can support decision-making and documentation when we're looking at things in the planning and pre-design stage. I always warn folks that when we talk about design, we're usually talking about pre-designed when we're talking about safety and safety analysis, because by the time that something is in design, the budget is set, the schedule is set, and so it becomes really, really hard to modify things, right? Your big bang for your buck is when you can make a change in planning before all the lines are finalized on the plan, right? That's right. Um, so um, I took a tool that Federal Highways just released on um, safe system, a safe system framework and assessment, um, modified that so that it becomes a lot more simple with like drop downs and things like that, because I think the user experience is very important um, and the projects don't always have enough funding to do that last bit of just polishing it so that the user experience is one um, of ease. Um, not a whole lot of tabs, one for intersections, one for segments, right? Not like 20 tabs. Um, simple things like that could make a big, big difference. And then um, really going into what was developed very critically, looking at what we know about things like road safety audits, road safety assessment, human factors, right? Um, focusing on the typical, you know, exposure, likelihood, and severity um, concepts that uh, Shane, you are very familiar with, uh, but then also digging into um, things that was not included in the Federal Highways tool when it comes to crash types. And when we think about safe systems, there's a few crash types that really um, um, makes us sit upright um, because they can make a big, big difference in the fatalities and serious injuries. And those are the head-ons. Um, that's usually really severe. Uh, Right-angled or angled crashes um, for for those of you that's driving on the other side of the road, we'll just say at angle crashes. And yes, I've driven on both sides of the road and it, it becomes second nature. It's just fine. Um, so at angle, um, head on, um, your crashes with your vulnerable road users or your active transportation users, or as we call them, people walking and rolling. So that includes all ages and abilities. Um, and then a group, uh, group called run-off-the-road crashes. So 
um, the kinds of crashes that are usually associated with more rural environments where someone um, either loses control, falls asleep, or just departs from their lane uh, for some sort of a reason, like destruction, um, and then uh, ends up um, crashing into something on the roadside, hopefully a barrier, but um, sometimes, um, you know, it's it's other things that they crashed into. Um, so um, the tool at this point, and it's it's about 95% done, and if anybody's interested, they can contact me. Uh, we're always willing to share. I work for a public agency. So what I do is for the public, um, in the hands of the public. But um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm doing that polishing of did we cover all the key essential concepts? And then um, are we taking care of the crash types? So that when somebody is doing an analysis of an intersection or a segment, that they can see the full picture um, in terms of not just exposure, likelihood, and severity, but also the different crash types and what might modify um, the outcomes of those. So we're super excited about it in our yeah. active transportation group. Um, they, they're thinking that they can leverage that to get a better feel for things like level of traffic stress at intersections, which can be really, really tricky um, to, to determine. But uh, yes, so we've got multiple divisions working with me and um, getting input from them. And we're super excited to, to pilot in our regions and hopefully um, implement it to, to help folks really understand what Safe Systems is about. Because at some level, I think at this point, it's a concept and we need to move it into actual practice. And I think uh, it is, you know, road safety is very complex. And so I think the safe system framework perhaps makes it a bit easier to communicate with people what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I think that's a challenge generally in road safety is sometimes uh, being able to communicate how complex uh, crash problems are and the solutions can be quite complex as well. People, as, you, as we uh, talked about earlier on, uh, sometimes people just focus on some pillars of the safe system, maybe enforcement on education and less on, on safer roads and safer speeds. So interested to know what your experience is like in Washington state in terms of, you know, the, where, where the emphasis is placed in terms of the safe system pillars. Um, can you talk about that a wee bit? Yeah, so, so right now we are in a very challenging financial situation. Uh, which puts a lot of pressure on um, basic expenditures like maintenance. And um, the folks that's been in safety for a while, we know that there are effects, spillover effects, when your maintenance investments isn't keeping up, there's spillover effects in terms of safety performance. Um, so that's unfortunately what is happening. But what we're what we're working on and what we are very privileged to have in our state is we have a Washington Traffic Safety Commission that was established in the 60s. And um, it's basically a group of state directors or secretaries that all serve together. So we've got uh, Department of Transportation, um, Health, um, we've got um, State Patrol, we've got Department of Licensing, just to mention a few, then we've got the, the cities and counties who are represented, and they get together on a regular basis to talk about safety. And the goal is really to have this um, really collaborative approach. Um, and I think there's, there's opportunities for us to strengthen that uh, further when you go down, down the ranks um, to um, folks that's, that's working on the ground. I know that some of our regions have really, really good relationships with um, state patrol. And so when they're working on a project, they will engage them into conversations around, you know, levels of enforcement, um, any particular experiences that they've had with either aberrant behaviors or um, motor vehicle crashes that has occurred and, and using that input when we're planning things on the ground. Um, so, but yes, I think we've got we've got a lot more work to do. And you touched on the communication piece. Um, I think that's 
that's another partner that we we often don't think about because it's not that obvious. But if all of us can work on how we're communicating and what we're communicating and making that communication effective, we can share with the public the phenomenal benefits that things like roundabouts can bring to the table. You know, mm-hmm. having a conversation at our roundabouts, people would be like, well, you know, I'm not so sure. And then the politicians would say, well, you know, I'm not going there. Um, I'm not I'm not cashing in those chips um, for for roundabouts. Um, and the conversation changed if you say, well, um, so in 2014, I did a a review and we had in the whole state so on the whole public roadway network we had just over 350 roundabouts and we had one fatal crash for all of them and i was blown away i i i always double check my work but this this time i triple check because mm-hmm. it was this is really real and when it's so real how can you not say that we should do everything we can to help the public understand what an enormous benefit the roundabouts will bring in terms of bringing our loved ones uh, safely home. Yeah, well, we find here in New Zealand and Australia that roundabouts are very effective as a safe system treatment on high speed roads. So great to see that you're pushing that in uh, Washington state. I know the US don't have a lot of roundabouts, although you're getting increasing number and it's really great to see that treatment being applied and, you know, in terms of um, all the different areas of uh, the different safe system pillars, people working in all those areas working together, I reckon there's a real um, benefit in people doing that. And I think that's one key aspect of safe system is that we're all trying to make the system safer. So we need everybody uh, involved in safety to work together to get the results that we all want, which is to drive down deaths and serious injuries. So. So it's been really great, Ida, catching up and talking with you today. Thank you very much. Yes. And um, we'll see you when I'm next in the US, no doubt. Okay, sounds good. Thank you.